In this video, we're going to test the assumption that the errors have constant variance. In other words, we're going to test for homoscedasticity. We're going to begin, begin by looking at the scatter plot we constructed for the linearity test. And this is what we want to see. We want to see that the residuals have no relationship with the predicted values of y. And that's depicted by this flat red curve. It's basically a flat line with no slope and an intercept of zero. Now if we click on a data point here, we can move this purple box under predicted values of y under the variable x3. And then we can change the label to x3. Okay, so what this scatter plot is telling us with an R-square of 0 0.0058, that X3 does not, is not associated with residual. In other words, there's no relationship between the residual and X3. The bow is very slight, and that suggests that this is a horizontal band of points, which is exactly what we want to see. We move the purple box under X2, and we get a similar picture. Again, we can conclude that the residual in X2 are most likely unrelated. The bow in the red curve is very slight. The R-square is very tiny. Click on a data point again. We can move this to X3. With X3, we see quite a bit of a bow. So if there is a problem with Holman's scedasticity, it's probably being caused by X1. formally test for homoscedasticity, also known as constant variance of the error, we have to run a second regression. In our first regression, our primary regression, we regressed team winning percentage on its field goal shooting percentage, its opponent's three point field goal percentage, and its opponent's average number of turnovers. In the subsequent or secondary regression, we're going to create a new y variable. And that new y variable is the set of squared residuals. We square each of the, the residuals. So we take the value, for example, in cell G9, and we square it. And we do this for all of the residuals. And these residuals represent the estimated variance of each of the observations. Okay. Now, in this secondary regression, we're going to include in the set of x's the original set of independent variables. In addition to these, we have to include interactions. For example, x1 times x2, x1 times x3, x2 times x3, and quadratic transformations of x1, which is just the value in cell i2, squared. Quadratic transformations of x2, and quadratic transformations of the values under x3. So, in this subsequent regression, we have a new y and a new, and a new set of x's. So we proceed by going to Tools, Data Analysis, Regression. We define the y variable by highlighting the label that corresponds to the squared residuals.
the labels corresponding to the original set of independent variables, the interaction of those variables, and the quadratic transformations of those variables, and all the observations. We click on labels, and then we want to choose the output range right below the data. That's what I like. That's what I prefer to do. We don't need to click on the residual, so we don't need to do that in this secondary regression. Okay. Okay, in the secondary regression, we have our output here, and I'm going to go ahead and format it like I did before. Okay, and we don't need this stuff over here. Just as before, I'm going to delete it. Okay. So, what this is telling us what this is telling us is um, we have a we've estimated the model residual squared equals this intercept plus this coefficient times that variable plus this coefficient times that variable plus this coefficient times that variable, plus this coefficient times this new variable, yada, yada, yada. Okay? And if we notice, if you notice, the p-values associated with the x1 variable, the p-values are all larger than 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0.01. So x1, its interactions, and the quadratic transformation of x1, all of those are statistically insignificant at the 10%, 5%, and 1% levels. So our reservations that we had concerning x1 Our reservation that we had concerning x1 is unfounded. We were worried about homoscedasticity in x1 because we had such a large dip here in this red curve. But white squared, white squared reg, uh, residual regression is telling us x1 is not problematic because x1, its interactions, and its quadratic term are all statistically insignificant. We can say the same thing about x2, its interactions, and its quadratic term. All these p-values are bigger than 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. So x2, its interactions, and its quadratic term are all insignificant. And we concluded that from in the same in the, in the scatter plot of the residual verse x2 remember that okay we can also make the same conclusion about x3 its p values the p values associated with x3 the interaction terms and x3's quadratic term are all also larger than 0 0.10 so x3 its interaction terms and its quadratic term are all insignificant predictors of the squared residual. And again, we saw that in the scatter plot of x3 and the residual. Okay. Okay. So individually, none of these variables are significant predictors of the squared residual or the estimated variance of the observations. Now because all these p-values are very, very large, it suggests that these values are statistically no different than zero. Hence, the F statistic is really close to zero. Now, we know this is close to zero because its p-value, which Excel calls significance f, is close to one. 
So we cannot reject the hypothesis that these coefficients are all statistically no different than zero. What that means is we conclude from this test that the errors are homoscedastic. In other words, the variance of the errors is constant.